right, folks, grab a seat and pour your drink neat as Whiskers and Whiskies present Tales of the Trophies, the Big Ten's greatest rivalries. I'm Mike, back with EJ and Joe. Fellas, how we doing? Doing fantastic. We're great. We had some big games this past weekend, but uh, not my team. <laughs> not not your team, indeed. You got some, We got some big games on the horizon, though. That's for damn sure. And we'll, I know we'll get to that Ooh, here, man. but once again... We are we are blessed. Hashtag blessed to have a a guest on the show here. Joe, would you like to to introduce our special guest? Sure. So our, our special guest this week is uh, one of my best friends from Michigan. He is, I don't know your exact title, but he works for New Holland Brewing and Distilling. And Some best not friend. The owner. Not, not the owner. <laughs> not the owner. Not the owner. He doesn't. Yeah. He doesn't want to claim that. <laughs> Stock must be down. Um, <laughs> So he's here to talk about New Holland and tell us what we're drinking. And uh, we can just jump jump right into it. But his name's Adam Dickerson. And uh, we're drinking the Beer Drinkers Old Fashioned today. So I don't know if you want to tell us a little bit about, about that and uh, a little bit about New Holland. Yeah. What's up, guys? Thanks for having me. Appreciate welcome it. to the show, Adam. Yeah, yeah welcome. Big fan of what you're doing so far. Glad to be part of it. Um, yeah, super excited when Joe invited me on. Uh, I get to talk about whiskey and alcohol a lot, but I don't really get to talk about sports too so it's pretty good um <laughs> what we're drinking tonight is it called a uh, beer drinkers old-fashioned uh you can use any kind of new holland whiskey you'd like whether it's our beer barrel bourbon product shot or uh dragon's milk bourbon is where we originally had made this but what you do is you take our dragon's milk stout and if you're willing to kind of get experimental and work on it a little bit you take the stout, you boil it down um, and add sugar and it turns itself into a really cool, sweet, but like savory syrup. And it makes your regular old fashioned into something kind of different, unique uh, and really good. So it's like two ounces of bourbon, a half ounce of that syrup and about a um, couple drops of bitters. And uh, I'm using an orange peel tonight. That's a little same here. Twist same around there. Should we give it a try? Yeah, yeah let's do it. Let's do it. Cheers, Cheers. boys. Oh, that's really nice. This, so, okay. So I always, yeah. always, always drink the drink before, like we do our tasting. Like it's just what I do. Cause you know, I'm an alcoholic. can't help myself, <laughs> but I waited this time because I wanted to give my pure unadulterated reaction. And that is lights out. Awesome. I don't, well, right, let's get another sip here. Let's see what they yeah, can Thank you. No, it's uh when I was making the the syrup, obviously I was a little nervous. I've never really made that. I've watched a couple of cooking shows on how they make caramel, which is disgusting to me. How much sugar <laughs> is put in making caramel? Well, I was afraid that that's what would happen. Like I'd caramelize it or, or boil, like overboil it. it. It turned out, but I I tasted it to make sure, and it was super sweet. But in this drink, with everything added, the bitters, the orange peel. Uh, the bourbon it's not as sweet as i thought and it is wonderful yeah, yeah. it's it's really good like the car it, like caramel definitely comes through and like i mean dragon's milk is like definitely a it's a good rich beer and like you get a lot of that it, it's fantastic i'm i'm loving the hell out of I think this that thing. Just I, made shows... a, I made a double on purpose i i had all the faith in the world in you adam i knew you were gonna steer us <laughs> wrong we had that dragon's milk when with bourbon when joe uh first joined us and yep. ever since then I, i'm super high on it this is great Thank you very much. Yeah, I think that the syrup, it just adds, uh, I like to say savory, but like this kind of richness that you yeah. don't get in a normal syrup. And it's just another added depth of flavor that I think makes it just really interesting. It's like definitely the number one selling cocktail at our tap rooms and our tasting rooms. So glad you guys enjoy it. So do you guys have like just a whole like vat of the syrup ready to go? Our bartenders work hard, like every couple of days I'm making a fresh batch. Cool. It's, not, it, um, it's not like super hard to make, but I feel like no. it's, you don't want a ton of it if you're not going to use it, you know? Yeah. It doesn't last forever. I, yeah. I wouldn't keep it around for more than a week or so, but um, yeah, there's enough sugar in there to make it shelf stable for a little while. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's for anyone who, who uh, wants to give it a try, it's just challenging enough to be fun, not yeah. challenging enough to be like, too difficult to actually execute so the recipes on our website dragonsmilk.com and you can check out all a bunch of recipes on there too 
Yeah, I gotta say, hats off to the to your website because you guys did a great job of like walking through the process and the tips too, like how you want to hard pour the beer in to help and yeah. like some of the tips to help get the carbonation out. Like that was helpful. I definitely wouldn't have done that without that. So that was good. Oh, yeah. Um, and I, I think it turned out pretty well and definitely not overly challenging. I mean, it's it's Monday. So I made this on a Monday <laughs> after work. So and my Mondays are terrible meetings from dawn till dusk so i still had the energy to make this thing and i'm super pleased i did. made a double because like i said i was anticipating it being good and i'm glad i did awesome yeah i'm still looking at the website here and i'm eyeing up this uh dragon's milk white whiskey sour maybe as a different week we'll do one of those it sounds pretty good very yeah. similar yeah yeah that sounds good now i know you said this is real popular in the tap room right like what's What's the vibe like at, at like your tap room and tasting room? Like I've never been to New Holland Brewing, but like I yep. love going to all kinds of good like breweries and distilleries and trying stuff. What's what's the vibe like there? And uh, yeah. you know, tell tell us a little bit about the experience. Yeah, we try to just create really really solid moments for people to come in and, and enjoy both beer and spirits, which is a unique thing for us um, at all of our locations. But we've got right now we've got. Um, Four, yeah, four locations. We've got two brew pubs, one in Holland, Michigan, right on the lakeshore, and one in Grand Rapids. They're a little bit different in their vibe intentionally. We wanted to kind of create something different. And so in Holland, it feels really kind of, um, nowadays I would call traditional, but it's in an old brick building. And, um, you know, it feels more like your neighborhood pub, your neighborhood yeah. kind of tavern. And then in Grand Rapids, what we have is something completely different. It's a, a really um a, a quite large location really kind of contemporary and modern like clean really kind of feels like you're in a, in a big city you've got like a giant beer garden in the back a really oh, nice tall ceiling with like open open air garage doors that open uh, I love so that. that one feels like when you're there on a weekend night or even a wednesday thursday friday evening it, it's got a real energy to it like it feels like you're out with some friends having a really like upbeat moment yeah. um and so a little bit different vibes at both and then we've got some tasting rooms in some little uh, resort towns in on West in West Michigan where you can come and just get like a cocktail or a, a spirit, um, a whiskey or something. Let's say I'm stopping at one of the brew pubs. What do I got to eat? Because I got to know what kind of food is good there too. Like yeah. what's what's you what's what's your go-to? You can't come to either of our brew pubs without getting uh, pepperoni pinwheels. Like yes. we we tried to open the second location without them because they're like take a very specific oven to make and like people were like. Like they were going to burn down the building. They so, <laughs> so they're essentially like pizza roll. Like I'm pretty sure like 20 years ago, one of our chefs was like at the end of the night, had some extra pizza dough and like rolled yes. them up. Like they look like little cinnamon rolls, but they're pizza and they're so freaking good. They're amazing. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. I, some of the best recipes come out of uh, like a little creativity like that. Yep. You know, that's, that's fantastic. So are these something you can freeze and maybe uh, we could try on the show here absolutely yeah <laughs> you can buy them in our store to go um but i don't know how i i could try to ship them to you guys but uh, we can figure that out off, figure offline it out. yeah we'll, we'll dry i still be fine what, what i can say is so I, I well the three of us that are michiganders were all born on the east side of the state and yep. my parents have since moved uh the last decade over to kalamazoo so i had only been to grand rapids once and then that kind of area uh, holland grand rapids and I had no idea the kind of beer scene that was there. Uh, yeah. They even have like a beer passport because there's like 30 plus breweries in that area. Yeah. It's absolutely awesome. I highly recommend. Maybe not in the wintertime because it's right off the lake and it's a little cold and snowy. A little cold. But if you can get out there, it's just an awesome beer scene. Obviously, people, you know, New Holland's well known. Um, and yeah, it was great. It, it kind of, I, I guess I just, even being from Michigan, I had no idea uh, what was all out there. Founders and, you know, there's a few famous ones, um, yeah. including New Holland. But, yeah, it, it was great. I, I couldn't believe it. Yeah, it's super fun. Get on out here. Give New Holland a call. We'll host you. I, I know Dragon's Milk is, like, super popular. Like, whenever I think of New Holland, that's definitely the one that, like, kind of comes to comes to mind for me for sure like do you guys like barrel age a lot of stuff like do you see people being like oh yeah barrel age stat is good but like trying to barrel age like you know an ale like ipa or something like that is that something yeah. you guys do too or? yeah if if it can be brewed we've probably barrel aged it by now. <laughs> um, whether it's you know whiskey beer gin 
vodka, you know, uh, any type of beer. We've barely, we've barrel aged salsa. We've barrel aged hot sauce. Salt? Yeah. <laughs> we've, we, we've got so many barrels. It's like, we've really, we literally turned them into furniture because we've just got so many. What? I mean, we're like the number one highest selling uh, barrel aged out. I, I would say probably in the world because it's the number one in the United States. And well, if you got T-Pain selling you, that's yeah. good to go. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we just moved through so many barrels. It's crazy. So we just try to do everything we can with it. The whiskey we're drinking tonight is actually aged in new oak and then aged in dragon's milk barrels to give it a really nice kind of mocha kind of coffee, like uh, chocolate, like finish. So that's really nice. Um, but at any point you can come to our brewery. Um, I'm not exactly sure when this will air hundred percent, but in like November, we will, uh, we'll having, we're having like this big event called barrel bash and it's like, Ooh. we're tapping like 35 barrel aged beers and a whole bunch of stuff. So damn that is i mean i know that ej and joe have some some things happening with the family coming up in november but i'm free i might just make yeah. a trip up Come on we'll out. Yeah. Like you'll get one third of whiskey whiskers and whiskey yeah, yeah. <laughs> the bigger third so you know uh just by size pure volume uh so wait but one thing too i was curious about is that i mean you guys do you you brew and you distill i feel like there's not a lot of companies that do both of that how how do yeah. you guys get into that it was honestly uh, just like a nature of kind of curiosity from our owner. And we just had so many people um, over the years asking, like, can they get a cocktail at our location? And I think our owner just got tired of saying no. And he literally like just called up this guy who runs the American Distilling Institute. It's like a, uh, what would you call that? Like an association of distillers. Yeah. Um, and he literally just like, hey, let's go to your brewery. We found a bunch of old scrap pieces of equipment, built a still out of it, and just started making whiskey and gin. Get and now, out of here. yeah, now uh, probably like 15 years later, 13 years later or so, um, yeah, we're like the second largest distiller in Michigan and selling a lot of whiskey and a lot of like canned cocktails and, and gin. And yeah, it's, it's crazy. But um, we just really try to make sure like anyone who comes into our locations has something they're going to want to drink. Um, and we like, we don't like to say no to people. So yeah. So I know that like uh, something that surprised me when I've gone on a couple um, distillery uh, tours and stuff was that how um, even though if the place is known for whiskey, gin is a, a, a typically made because it, it's faster. You can it, distill yeah. it faster and you can sell it while you're waiting for the whiskeys to age and stuff. Do you know, and I have no idea if you know this or I'm curious, are there any kind of um, a ret like uh, ingredients that can go in between beers or any of the various whiskeys or gins that make it a little easier. If you do one, you could potentially do the other. Yeah. I mean, essentially to make, um, to make whiskey, you have to be able to make beer first um, because whiskey is essentially at its core, like distilled beer without hops. So you, you take gotcha. your malt, you take your yeast, you ferment that with water and, um, and you get alcoholic, you know, an alcoholic liquid anywhere from, you know, four to 20%, like a beer. And then you take that and you run it through the distill, boil it, you capture all that evaporation, which is the alcohol, condense it back down into liquid, and you've got high proof spirit. So if you're making, if you're making beer, you're halfway there. Um, so it makes it, we, we have, we literally, half of the process happens in our brewery and yeah. the, the that like um, wash gets moved over to the distillery and uh, distilled. I just yeah. love how it all came about too. Like, yeah. <laughs> all right. These people want cocktails. Let's just make some, let's make some booze, but like, no, let's not just make booze. Let's make really good booze too. Because yeah. like that dragon's milk bourbon is delicious. Thank you. Yeah. So, so had... dragon's milk. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, that's all right. Go ahead. I was gonna say dragon's milk. The, the beer is kind of the OG and then the bourbon stemmed from that, it yeah. sounds like. So do yeah. you guys have, or do you have a favorite, uh, like newer up and coming spirit or beer that you guys are excited about? Oh, yeah. I don't think I can say a couple of things, but people should say anything there. that's come out recently that you're, that yeah, you're but you know, of. I mean, there, we're going to be releasing a bunch of cool whiskey in the next five months. I just can't cool. say too much about it yet. So keep an yeah. eye out on social media. Yeah, sorry. I didn't mean to put it up. I just mean, I was just 
looking for something that we could highlight that give us uh, the beats give us out. the scoop here yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, we've moves. got older and older whiskey coming we've been aging whiskey for up to 10 years so like oh, we've nice. got more stuff coming out soon that's going to be really awesome um but yeah we're i mean we are just about to release in november a 10-year single malt so if you think of if you're more of a scotch drinker you're probably familiar with the term single malt it's uh, barley based rather than corn um we distill it all in a pot still like the traditional scotch distillers do and we've aged it for 10 years finished it in sherry casks so Ooh. that's called zeppelin bend reserve and it's a 10 year old whiskey and that'll be available only at our um tap rooms but maybe we can ship to you guys a bottle and you can you can oh, have yeah. a, uh, McAllen have a does it podcast McAllen does a sherry cask whiskey that I love. So I'm, yeah. I'm, my wife hates it. She says it smells, she doesn't like the sweetness. Sure. I love it. So I'm, I'm going to have to get that shot. That sounds right up my alley. Yeah. There are not very many uh, American distillers making 10 year old single malt whiskey. So we're super excited about it. And, uh, um, and that'll release in like a month. So keep an eye out for that for sure. Awesome. Awesome. I think I know. You, you mentioned you might be coming out in a couple months. Maybe we could uh, do a yeah. live recording and maybe you could bring some with you. Absolutely. I will be, I can see how much they'll let me bring on my, on my flight. It's like four or five bottles of work. <laughs> <That's fine. laughs> I know actually I went, uh, I was at the store and I don't know what I was there for, but I came across your Ichabod. Is that Ichabod yeah. for crane? Yeah. Uh, the pumpkin. I haven't opened it yet. I was actually saving it for a podcast. Um, uh, so that I could share it with these two, but I'm really excited for it. And then I saw uh, on your Don't social you media, guys, that. you've posted Don't about it. I have, I haven't, um, but I, I'm, I love pumpkin beer and I'm really excited to try yours because I, I, yeah. I haven't tried it yet. Yeah. You know what, EJ, I love about you is that you're confident yourself enough to say you love pumpkin beer because I love pumpkin <laughs> beer too. And I'm sick of people thinking they're too good for pumpkin beer because it tastes good. Um, I am too good. I love for pumpkin it. Beer. Yeah, I just don't like pumpkin. Joe is one of those people. I love it. I hate pumpkin I love anything. Pumpkin beer. And uh, Ichabod's great because it's like it's it's seventy five percent amber ale, like twenty five percent pumpkin. So it's yeah. not like you're drinking pumpkin pie in a glass or like you're not drinking sure. PSLs. Yeah, it's not like yeah, it's not the pumpkin spice latte in a glass. It is still beer. Um, yeah, yeah it's that awesome. that I would try, even though I don't like pumpkin. I'd, I'd give that a try. So yeah. Yeah, see, I don't, that's why I don't like some of them because they're too sweet. And I, I'm glad that you guys, uh, I'm definitely, EJ, don't open it or else. I, I haven't. It's still in my garage. They're just sitting there waiting for me to chill them for eventual consumption. All right, man. All right, guys. Do we have a, any other questions? I have one non-related beer question for Adam, but I'm not going to ask it until until we've gotten all of our uh, beer questions out and, and bourbon and, and all these wonderful alcohol related Man, questions. Fire away. I'm good on my end, pal. We want to give, is... it, give it a quick rating. Oh yeah. Oh well, yeah. yeah. Let's write this before I ask this unrelated question. What's the scale? One to One five. To five. Do you a point? Point two, five point. You can do whatever you want. You can we'll do whatever apps, yeah. you apps. want. Who's first? I'll go. Um, I am a huge fan of this drink. Um, I definitely think it's one of my favorites that we've done thus far. And I think it's, I really like the orange and, um, I usually have, uh, Peshad bitters, which taste different than, uh, ooh, how do I say this? The a one R yes, that one, <laughs> which is a very different flavor. If you guys don't realize bitters have, um, much different flavors. Was that uh, your question for the same? No, it wasn't. But I just like the citrus of, uh, of this, uh, drink along with that syrup, which makes it so unique, uh, compared to any other, um, old fashioned that you'll have. So I'm really, uh, this, I'm really high on this, um, of all the drinks that we've had thus far. So I'm going to probably put it at like a 4.5. Like I honestly might make us take a break just so I can get another one. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll go next. And I mean, call it pandering, call it. I'm really excited for the sherry. The, I want some of that sherry oak. I want a whole bottle myself. Pepperoni pinwheels, mail some of that to me. So call me, <laughs> call it pandering, call me a show, but it, it's a five for me. This is fantastic. I mean, it doesn't like old fashioned my favorite. So this is right up my alley. Maybe it feels good too, that I feel like I did a really good job on the simple syrup too. Like that, that, you know, is maybe I'm happy about that. Um, but yeah, I love it. It's, it's right up my alley. It's a five for me. I'm enjoying the hell out of this. Love it. All right. I'm going to go, I'm going to go 4.75. Uh, wow. Yeah, Whoa. I, I think it's great. Uh, and, and like, like you guys said, it's easy to make. Um, uh, I was a little, 
a little hesitant at the beginning, just because like, when you see the recipe, you're like, well, I got to boil this stuff down. I'm not, I'm not a chef here. Yep. Um, but it's great. Awesome. Thank you. Guys. Chef Appreciate it. All right, Adam, I just got to know. So I kind of alluded to this earlier. Um, yeah. We're from the Eastern part of the state. And um, like I said, my parents have now lived out there for 10 years uh, on the West side in Kalamazoo. Um, you've probably been out there for close to that too, right? Almost a decade out on yeah. the West side. They absolutely love it. Said they would never move back to the East side again. Yeah. How do you compare the West side of Michigan compared to the East side? Yeah, I couldn't say I would never move back, but it would take a lot. Like I yeah. really, really love it out here. Um, Grand Rapids is definitely feels like home. It's like the perfect size city and you can get out into the woods, the beach, um, you know, out into the country, doing whatever you want to do, skiing, hiking, any outdoor activity, like at a moment's notice. And the city is a great size, a great community. Um, got everything you need. Like you said, the beer scene, if you're, if you like to drink alcohol, like I do, um, it's <laughs> great. It has everything you need. Um, yeah. and you know, I think I, I was like a little bit, my timing was right. Like I, you know, someone might say I just like gave up on the east side but when I moved out here it was at a time where it was just like an all-time low like people were just so pessimistic living on the east side and it's just like out here sure. uh, everyone's just in a good mood and and I've been back and Detroit is just killing it right now like For sure. I love getting back over there there's so much to do it's so vibrant right now they're doing so much to try to turn that city around but I, I definitely really enjoy living on the west side. And I think it's just like, I don't think a lot of people realize or think of Michigan um, as a destination for like summer vacation, but like, especially Lake Michigan, the, the beaches on the West side of the state are class. Like yeah. they're very, very nice. Um, yeah. It's, it's, you might, I mean, like people really, like we get so many people in visiting the brewery from all over the country and the world. And they're like, this, you might as well be in California. I'm like, yeah, the beaches are huge. You can't see the other side of the lake. The yeah. water doesn't taste like salt. If you get right. a fresh water it. and, yeah. uh, and you, you have surf. a winter, you're really, people can ski. People really can, aggressive. Yeah. you can surf, uh, you can <laughs> on like a really stormy day. There are people who go out with their surfboards, but, uh, that you need, you need some storms and some wind. Uh, but yeah, it's really, it's really kind of a cool place to live. Michigan beaches are definitely on my bucket list. I, I've seen American pie too, you know, they, yeah. they were, I, I know, yep. I know what that seems like. I want to get out there. Yeah. And especially yeah. now, now that, now that I know that all the good beer and booze that's out there, I got to do it. Yeah. You got to go up the coast all the way from Holland up to Traverse city and you're going to have a hell of a time. That's so I was going to put, put it on the calendar. All right, guys. Uh, you guys want to transition into some uh, college football talk? Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's, let's do it. it. All right. Why don't we do a recap of last week's or this last weekend's uh, games? Uh, so let's start off with the two games, uh, the trophy games that we had talked about last episode and in a couple episodes prior to that um, before we get into the rest of the ones. So let's talk about the old brass spittoon. So I can kind of start here since I'm uh, the only Spartans fan here right now. Um, but it was a dog fight. I kind of, we talked about this, uh, you know, Mike and Joe thought it would be, and probably should have been an easier fight. I just kind of had that pessimism feeling and, you know, with the uh, Indiana coming off their bye, uh, not having the season they want, it was homecoming, uh, felt like we were going to get their best and, they gave us a punch very fortunate um, that we uh, survived this game but some of the highlights for me is uh, Micah McFadden who's been a linebacker there I feel like for nine years he is just incredible was all over the field really helped bottle up our run game um, and the defense just did what it does the entire season kind of a bend don't break and forced um field goals, uh, really good red zone defense and force field goals instead of touchdowns. And that was really the difference, uh, a couple key turnovers, but um, yeah, it was, uh, it was a little nerve wracking, but I'm glad that we kind of came out with uh, the victory in a bye week. Hey uh, man, they don't ask how they ask how many you guys got. A, I mean, yeah, every game's tough. And we talked about it. I mean, every game's kind of tough in the big 10 this year. And uh, you guys got one, hell of a running back on your squad too i mean he's going to be trouble he, if you guys can get a lead against a team 
like, you know, Michigan, Penn State, like, and he can just keep pounding the rock. You guys could be able to sustain it just fine. I think Ohio State, I mean, that's another story if they keep playing that way. But still, like yeah. I said, I, I think CJ Stroud is he's still a young kid and due uh to make some mistakes. So if you can get a lead and sustain it, I mean that kid's gonna keep it going for you. So see, I feel a little bit different. I mean, this week I think was was a, a week that he should have proved proven himself and he came out. I'm looking at the stats right now. He had 80 yards, but how much of that was forced at the end? Like he didn't really show up when it was time for him to show up. I watched most of that game and I didn't think he was there like him and, and Thorne as well. Same thing. Like if you're on Heisman watch, you're putting up kind of garbage numbers against Indiana. I don't know. Yeah. Don't well, see it. There, there's plenty of, uh, of, I think Heisman candidates that at the beginning of the season, compared to where they are now. And I think we'll talk about one of those guys in a little bit uh, when we get to Oklahoma, but no spoilers, but yeah, I think a Heisman is really wide open right now. Like there's no one really running with that race. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. I think the key, I think the key for, for Walker and really just Michigan state in general is again, like they've gotten where they they've gotten through their schedule so far, obviously well ahead of schedule, but I, I, and I think the Heisman talk is always a tricky situation because like you really can't talk until close to the season, the end of the season. So you have obviously Michigan state has their three best opponents that they haven't played yet. And I would argue, obviously, if you're a Heisman hopeful, you have to play not only just, you have to be consistent. You can't just have a couple of good games, but you also have to um, play well um, against uh the best competition and, and running yeah. backs are always at like a disadvantage, right? I think there's only been two running back Heisman's in the last 15 years. It's, it's not as much as you'd expect. Yeah, no, it's it's usually a quarterback. Right. Um, yeah. I think they're also like, you kind of touched on this, like their schedule has been, I mean, who have they played? Miami turns out to be garbage. North Northwestern same, but We'll see Michigan watch them go and lose to them this week. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna um, say, be careful what you're talking. No, I mean about. it's reality. Like, <laughs> and I think reality is what Walker was kind of brought down to this week. Hoosiers, eh, Rutgers. I don't know. I, I mean, the the best is yet to come for their schedule. So I guess that'll that'll we'll see. Yeah, and Rutgers. Speaking of them, they are no longer on my. Uh, I didn't <laughs> bet them this week, but yeah, they they no longer. They were my go-to for what every once in a while. You know, for for betting, it was uh, the first couple weeks. Rutgers. But the Roadrunners, UTSA, they never let me down. Meet me, love you guys. I will caveat covering. that. I think I think both Michigan State and Michigan, based on their schedules, are are still overranked. Well, we'll see. Yeah. We will see. I was looking ahead. Oh boy, <laughs> they, they, things get real interesting the next couple of weeks. Yeah, I mean that's just kind of how it is. That's why it's always it's always tough to. And I think Mike, I had mentioned this to you earlier. It's always tough to kind of like judge a team and it's just, it's natural habit. I'm sure I do the same thing, but it's always hard to judge a team midway through a season, because if I were to tell you um, a team beat a nine and three team that season, you'd probably say that was pretty solid. Right. Um, but what if that nine and three team started two and three? So yeah. at the beginning of the year, you'd right. say that team's Get garbage. Yeah. They yeah. suck. And it maybe just might meant that might've meant their schedule is front loaded. And then they kind of coasted to the end. Um, you know, and, and picked up nine, eight, four, nine, and three. So, so yeah. it's always really hard to judge any kind of opponent really until, you know, obviously some have the pass the eyeball test and look terrible, but I feel like that always kind of happens, right. That people try to compare schedules and, uh, who beat who, um, and so I mean, that's, that's because, the only way you can do rankings really. Well, that's why, well, yeah, that's why I mean, like a lot of the times it just needs to be like your team needs to play the, the team that you're comparing against and then that's how it gets resolved because I feel like that always kind of happens or a good opponent at the beginning of the year that you think is a quality win. And then they, you know, crap the bed. I don't think that necessarily means you played. A Look at you opponent. Clemson. Looking right at you. Clemson, yeah, it's, just, it's, a, it's always, yeah. No, it's I'm always looking at you, Dr. Situation. Pepper. They gave him the money early. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, speaking of people I'm yeah. looking at and, and made the biggest question coming for me out of this game was actually after the game and the locker room picture. Yeah. EJ, yeah. you said that to us. Yeah. Who the hell is the guy in the picture? Did, oh, I didn't put it in this. I'm sorry. I did not put this in the show notes for you guys. Um, oh, I'll yes. pull it up. I'll pull yes. it up right here. So it is a picture of it looked like primarily defensive players with the Spartans. So uh, they had the trophy, the old brass spittoon, and they took a picture. Uh, it was the running backs coach with about 
I don't know, 15 players. They all look defensive players actually too. I don't know. It's kind of a weird combination of coach and players, but there's a guy. One of these things is not like the other. uh, One of these things is most definitely not like the other. So uh, the coach is the one holding the spittoon. So he looks like, you know, professional. Uh, and then there's just a guy that looks like he's in his fifties, uh, you know, in a wife beater. And I don't think he's a player. And I, uh, there's no chance that, that guy's a player, a coach. Um, I don't know. A Sean Robinson looks like he's 50 and he's like 24. So <laughs> that's true. Well, um, a Sean's a grown man. So I've, I've no idea who that guy is. No clue. A grown man. But he also doesn't look like the kind of guy you're going to kick out of the locker room. No, so. no, no, no. <laughs> Not at all. He gets in there. You're just probably going to let, let it ride. He's but, just uh, looking for a spitter. He was looking for a little tuner and he's like, Hey, here's a good one. It's old and brass. Uh, yeah. I, I, I have no idea who that is, but that was, uh, that was the picture that I was able to find. Cause I, um, I was watching the game on my phone and I think the, the broadcast cut before they showed the trophy, uh, like, unfortunately we've seen a few times here on this pod where we don't actually get to see it. Um, but that was the picture that the Spartans uh, posted because of, you know, the coach and stuff, but no clue who that guy is. No idea. That's the biggest mystery of this trophy. Now find out next week. Let's dig in. Find out next week. I will try and figure out who that guy is. Um, All right. So why don't we then move on to our other uh, trophy game that happened this weekend, which was the $5 bits of broken share game. And for me, this was actually, I was fortunate enough because I had the Spartans on my phone um, and this game on the TV that I was watching. So uh, for me, it was a tale of kind of two halves here um, with Minnesota dominating the first half and the Corn Huskers making it much more of a game in the second half um, with ultimately Minnesota winning the game. Um, but were any of you guys able to catch this game at all? No, I was back and forth on it on the uh on the tv there i was i was going to i was heavily invested in florida uh but i did catch a little bit of this game uh and yeah i thought it was good uh, as 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 per usual uh you know pga flex looked incredible on the sidelines there that was probably my <laughs> biggest takeaway uh shout out coach brother about scotty oh. mako go first and uh yeah no i agree it was definitely like i didn't get to see everything because i was flipping back and forth uh but yeah it was definitely um uh, I changed it. And I was like, okay, what happened? And going into it, I really thought, you know, Nebraska is a tough team and, and they're going to get someone here soon. And uh, I admit this just ended up didn't be in it. I think they're going to get one at home when Michigan played them at home. It was a, I don't know. The setting was, was there. It's in their favor. I think that's when they're going to snag one. Yeah. 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 Martinez, I'm pretty sure only completed like three or four passes in the first half. It was uh it was a rough go for him. Um, there was there's one insane catch. I recommend you guys try and find it. Uh, Outman Bell. He was uh, he's a, the Minnesota um, wideout. Right before half, he had this insane catch right in the corner of the end zone where he was like pass interfered and it, he got his feet down, still caught it. It was absolutely insane. Um, but yeah, I think the tail of the second half was the Cornhuskers defense helped out. Uh, Tanner had. Um, two interceptions to pretty much start the, start the second half. Um, and Nebraska just kind of slowly, but surely mainly through the running game and uh, a few big catches by their tight end. Who's like six foot eight um, got them into the game, but ultimately it came down to, they were uh, so Minnesota was up seven with four minutes left. And all they really had to do was run the ball to end it. And they honestly did one better uh, and had a, a house call to go up uh, 14 and effectively kind of end that game. But uh, it was definitely, if you watched the first half, you were definitely surprised. Yeah. At well, I, that I mean, especially because Bryce Williams was running the ball so damn well. I mean, right. you, you would think that would be enough to put it away. Like, that's what I thought. I, I didn't watch much, much of the second half because we run the ball that good and you get into a lead, you know, I think it's, it's game over there, but did you, yeah. did we, and it also might have been homecoming too in Minnesota, so it might have been a pretty a bigger crowd than typical because of that. Yeah, yeah. Well, did you did um I don't know. Minnesota's big crowds. 
that, that home opener, I was pretty, I mean, Grant's home opener, but still. Against Ohio um, State. Yeah, that's true. Did um, they highlight the trophy? Yeah, I was going to say, was the trophy on the broadcast? So I did not see the trophy on the broadcast. Now, granted, I wasn't like glued to the TV because I was, you know, uh, glancing back and forth between that and the Michigan State. But I did see a picture of it after the game. Uh, and the following news is honestly awesome because if you guys have been listening, we've talked about how this game kind of isn't just all about the football game. And also, um, doubles is a, a really great fundraiser for two awesome charities. And so the, the trophy has a Twitter account and the uh, Twitter account tweeted some stats here after the game, which was pretty cool. So according to the trophy's Twitter account, they set a goal of just collecting um, $10,000 each uh, for each charity was their goal um, going into this year, like for this game. And the the final donations um, up until game time was uh, for the Gophers, which was for the Minnesota Masonic Children's Hospital. Uh, they ended up uh, getting $16,988 for that charity. And then the Cornhuskers donations, which were for uh, Team Jack Foundation, uh, got $25,354. Let's go. So they got Big a numbers. total of 42342 donated this this year. And uh, they said over $85,000 have been donated uh, since they've started big numbers trophy. for the kids let's go that's awesome yeah it was uh it was definitely um great to see uh, i think every year um hopefully we, we we helped with some of this awareness we actually do have uh one person joe if you want to talk about it that uh did tell us that they they did donate um yeah um so we have marty the sparty uh he shout out marty donated uh, keeping with the theme of the $5 bits of broken chair, he donated $55 to each charity. So 55 to team Jack and 55 to the children's hospital. And uh, so I think we're going to go ahead and match that. And unfortunately, Marty requested after the, uh, after the fact, he requested that I announce this on the podcast with a Spartans hat on. <laughs> Fortunately, we're all, we are all remote right now. So I don't have access to a Sparty hat. So I'm sorry, Marty. Um, but yeah, um, appreciate well, for the record, Marty. I had, a couple, much. I had a couple extra, but I was not, uh, I was not asked for said hat. So <laughs> yeah. I, I, maybe the text if only there was through. a place you could get yeah, a hat. I, think I, I didn't have service when I sent it. Yeah. I think Joe didn't have service this entire weekend. So, um, can anyone tell me more about this trophy though? Like, is it from like WWE or what is the deal <laughs> with what was the deal with a broken chair? DJ, you want to oh, give him a quick, quick synopsis? Yes. So this, this started, it, it's yes, it's awesome. Um, it's so unique. Uh, and it started with, uh, on Twitter, on the internet. So it was one of the positive things that came from the internet. One of the few, <laughs> well, especially Twitter. One of the few right. positive that, things. This podcast this. and the chair. Yes. <laughs> yes. That's it. Um, so there was two accounts. So you had, um, account called faux Polini, which is the, um, parody account of, uh, ex Nebraska coach, coach. Bo Pelini, uh, and the, uh, Minnesota mascot Goldie, the gopher. Um, <laughs> so essentially leading up to the game, um, that year, they, uh, the Bo Pelini or faux Pelini, actually no, it was Goldie. It was Goldie yeah. asked if they should, um, play for uh something this year and essentially it was kind of a backhanded comment like if my team wins why don't you give me five bucks and if my team loses why don't i break a chair over your back uh, and that just it was literally that and um someone saw the exchange uh between them and uh posted on reddit and said, can anyone mock up uh, what this would look like? And uh -huh. someone mocked up pretty similar to what it looks like now uh, of a broken chair with uh, a couple of $5 bills with the, uh, the the faces on it. So this was back uh -huh. in like golden age of Twitter too, when you had yeah. like these brand accounts like Goldie reaching out to like parody accounts. And then, yeah. I mean, you know, thankfully this one ended up well because this happened plenty of times and Come to the king, best not miss, but it went well. It went well this time. It went, it went better than well. It went splendid, fantastic, oh, lovely. Look I just at like that. I just like that we're still creating rivalry trophies. It's not like too yeah, late. Hell yeah. Yeah. Well, buckle up, buddy. 
Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you you want to talk about a new rivalry trophy? Yeah. You, you You're came on the, to the right, right episode. episode. Uh, it. Yeah, it, it was just really awesome. It was um, immediately embraced by the schools, which they obviously didn't have to because it was just random fans that created this thing. Uh, and then um, one of the trophy, the original trophy got, uh, I guess, lost. And someone then remade what the current trophy looks like. Just another random fan um, that was... Uh, reached out to at church actually uh which was pretty funny um but yeah it, it's a it's a cool one and then the the people that created this last trophy also decided that in order to help it stick and wanting it to mean more than just a trophy is they came up with the idea of the fundraiser the chair itty fundraiser uh every year um and that's what it's been so far which is really cool. Uh, so another very cool moment that I saw. So this is where I saw the picture of the trophy itself. It was, I, I do remember seeing a picture um, online. I can't, I couldn't find it again, but uh, uh, the picture that I posted for you guys in the notes um, was something that was also pretty equally as cool. So uh, during the tailgate pro before the game, former Minnesota player and five-time cancer survivor Casey O'Brien walked around with the trophy during the tailgate and let people take pictures with it. And I don't know if you guys remember, I once I saw his name, it like sparked something for me. And yeah. then I, I looked into it, but he was uh, the former Minnesota player that was fighting a really rare bone cancer. And in 2019, um, after I think at that point he had survived it four times, uh, he, his goal was just to get into a college football game. Like he was a uh, walk on and, uh, practice every day and everyone was rooting for him. And they, uh, he finally got into the game against Rutgers and he was the placeholder, uh, for a PAT and he finally got his chance to get on the field. Um, and then, uh, I think shortly after retired from playing just because, um, of him having to, to go through uh, chemo again, but very cool. That's uh, awesome. Yeah, and he was he was out there, and then the picture here uh, that I have posted here was with a, a little kid who was also a cancer survivor as well, um, from the same bone, the rare bone disease uh, they both have. So that's awesome, very cool. So that that trophy made its rounds uh, around the various tailgates prior to the game, which I thought was pretty cool. Yeah, that's dope. The trophy's small. I, I don't yeah, it's smaller than I thought it was going to be. Yeah, it's smaller. Than I, was, I, I think I was thinking more of a like a life size chair. Yeah, that's what I was thinking too. <laughs> might have been the first one. Might have been that big, but this uh, this remake was it looks like awesome, decent well, size, but that's fantastic. But about the uh, all well that ends well with the with the five dollar bits of broken Jerry trophy. That's fantastic. Yeah. So another note here is the official Twitter account said that they're going to keep that page live um, for. A couple more days in exactly say how long um so if you haven't had a chance uh to donate you can still donate um to both of those charities just go to brokenshare.com and uh you can you can uh, easily get the other links to those various um charities through there so recommend if you haven't had a chance uh please do uh because it's just for an awesome awesome charities all right. So why don't we talk about a couple other games that happened this weekend? So um, why don't we start with a couple of statement wins here? So this, this week we had, like Joe had mentioned, uh, quite a few great games. Uh, this first one, uh, number 12, Oklahoma state uh, versus number 25, Texas. Uh, we kind of highlighted this game. Uh, they are no. still not back. No. Uh, and we kind of talked about uh, Oklahoma state wasn't really getting much, um, you know, uh, much attention because their schedule was pretty light to this point. And we talked about how important it would be for them to continue their undefeated streak to Bedlam. And they did it, went into Austin and, uh, came away with a win. Yeah. And B. John Robinson, I mean, again, like you want to talk about tail two hats, like he was running all over the place and Texas had a big lead and then they lost it. So, you know, we don't like that. We don't like that one bit, especially when we bet on the Longhorns. We, we really don't like it. So, uh, yeah. Didn't learn your lesson. Well, you know, I, again, I thought surely the good Lord, uh, you know, and the state of Texas won't do this to me twice, three times. Um, yeah. So here we are. We're, we're, we're sad about this. Um, but 
Oklahoma State, we'll get to that. Their matchup for next week is very interesting. So, yeah, yes. I definitely think that that was a good win for Oklahoma State, but we'll see if they, uh, if they have what it takes. Definitely, if things stay the way they are, it will be an interesting bedlam. And one thing that stands out for me is this isn't the Oklahoma State that you're used to. This team's, believe it or not, getting a similar really good defense. Oregon. It's the defense really that's good doing defense. it. It's, they're not scoring 70 points like they have in the past. Although uh, Mike Gundy, right, Mike? Yep. Mike Gundy still has an on-point mullet. It is fantastic. Tennessee he, waterfall. He baby. has it faded up the sides, and it's like almost a mohawk mullet. Uh, he's is, still... Um, rocking the mullet for so long yeah like, he's committed i don't think he can change now I mean, I he's, know, like, he's a man he's 40 you know yeah. like college kids are like rocking the mullet right now he's been doing it for like 10 years like that dude <laughs> trendsetter he and he keeps it tight like I, I you know you kind of expect a mullet to maybe look a little i don't know like old age or i, I would argue it, Mahomes' hair is kind of mulletish. It's it's a, it's definitely mohawk, but it's it's kind of long in the back. But that's kind of what Gundy's rocking. It's it's a it's a clean it's clean on the sides, real clean. Yeah, real but it clean. is a party in the back still. I'll tell you that. If you're, if you're gonna have it, you got to keep it clean. I think. Yeah, yeah, he definitely does. Um, but yeah. Uh, so next game, uh, number I put dollar sign here in the show notes, but I meant number. 11 uh, Kentucky went to number one, Georgia and well, um, Georgia's just still the cream of the crop. Uh, yeah. I didn't bet this one. It would germ me crazy because you know, Mark's Mark Stoops just uh, does not care about Las Vegas or anyone. No, he does not. On, uh, yeah. So, uh, you know, that or does was, he, uh, or, or does he only his Kentucky or, or he does call Georgia time out with five seconds left to yep. cover. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, I mean, Georgia just, I mean, a defense, man, it's just so freaking good. I, I didn't really think that the cats were going to, you know, I, I didn't give them a chance in this one, but uh, yeah. I, and, and speaking of speaking of this, I just wanted to say that um, I've been watching the Alabama, Oklahoma game. I record it because I couldn't watch it live this weekend. I've been watching them on the side. And you said that, you know, you have a note here, EJ, that Georgia will not be tested until the SEC championship game. I'm going to go ahead and disagree. Because Alabama is terrible. This team is god awful. Uh, the coaches stink. Uh, Pete Golding, show, like, had I watched this game live, I would be losing my mind. Pete Golding is absolutely terrible. Uh, of all the defensive coordinators to not get hired somewhere else as a head coach, why does it have to be Pete Golding? Someone please take him. Anyone, LSU, just go right down the road, you know, wh- whatever. Uh, Bill O'Brien and Doug Marone stink. Uh, Alabama is winning games despite and covering because I did need them to cover and they did cover, but they're winning and covering games just based on talent alone. Uh, Their coaches aren't putting them in the right position. I think Georgia is going to run away with the SEC championship game if they play Alabama because Alabama might still lose a game before they go to the SEC championship. So. Well, I guess I just meant I don't think anyone in the East. I think obviously Florida, which we will get to in a little bit. I, I just don't think they're going to get much. I, I you see a, an up and coming team like Kentucky. I feel like honestly, Kentucky reminds me a lot of Michigan State, and the the maybe the level where Michigan State is at, like um, competitive wise, and it's just kind of Georgia showed that they're just that that step above. They're they they're in that elite category. Um, and, uh, you know, majority of other teams are just kind of in that next tier. Um, but that's, that's kind of what that showed me was that they're just kind of biding their time to the playoff, right. To really to the national championship game. They're just, I mean, I think so. trying not to yeah. get injured. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, and then the, the next, uh, statement game, I would just, uh, we can quickly kind of talk about this, but Oklahoma played TCU, and Oklahoma started Caleb Williams, um, officially ending Spencer Rattler's season and his draft hopes. Um, it, it's it's, See it's Williams' portal, teams pal. now. Yeah. And uh, this just kind of stood out to me just because uh, the powers that be like this win so much that they jumped Oklahoma uh, over Cincinnati, mm-hmm. which isn't too surprising. Wait, did they? I thought Cincinnati's too. I, I feel like I saw some polls. Uh, I just have a hard time believing that coming down the stretch again, Oklahoma is going to beat probably at least play another ranked team, beat another ranked team most likely. So 
I think it's just one of those things where Cincinnati's sweet spot's probably going to be number three. Um, I don't think if they go undefeated, I don't think they'll go higher than two, won't go to four, but I, I really think three is probably going to be AP where has them be at two, which is crazy. Yeah. Because, well, I mean, Grant, the committee hasn't come out with their rankings yet, but like, yeah, that's, I mean, because if you have them at two, you, they could potentially be one. If yeah, you're what's going yeah. to put them back? I mean, like, they're, they're not probably going to lose another game. So. Right. No. Right. <laughs> Yeah, Adam, I, I who's, think, who's your top four? Who's your who's your CFP top four right now? Who who you think? Yeah, I think where I mean, we I are think, now. I've I'm got saying. Georgia and Cincinnati for sure, guys. That I just don't think I don't think Cincinnati's going to lose another game, and yeah, isn't that what the whole playoffs for is just to get some of these teams a chance to compete at the end. But um, yeah, I'm going like wild card. I think Oklahoma's going to lose to Oklahoma State, and so I think there's. I don't I don't know if I'm going to be able to call all four, but. I definitely think Georgia and Cincinnati are in there. Um, I mean, I, there's going to be a Big Ten team. Yeah, it's going to be a battle till the end. Yeah. So might as well just like hold up the U of M for once. It's there been, you go. <laughs> it's been too long to even like talk about them. Can I do it while you can? Competing for a championship. So like, yeah. I'm just going to like go for it and like and say it for once in the last 12 years. Um, we've got the bases covered. I said they're overrated. You're you've got them in the college football playoff. We're good. Yeah, I just they're playing safe. They're playing solid. And, uh, you know, I just think they're going to be, I think this, if there is a year, this could be the year. So I'm going to, I'm going to go for it and say they're in the, in the playoff. This is the year that if you're one of those teams that are just having a great year, you got a shot. Clemson's officially out. Ohio state stumbled, you know, they've lost the game. That's they don't do that. So Alabama doesn't look invincible anymore. Yep. Um, no, they, they stink. Actually, if you, I, I just said that they stink. So they're, they're, their talent is outplaying their coaching is what's happening. No, I, I honestly think the Big Ten is going to be the conference to watch in November in, in late October because it's a meat grinder for it's especially the, the, the East. I mean, Penn State, Michigan, Michigan State, Ohio State, those guys. I mean, th- those are going to be some great games. They're going to beat the holy hell, hell out of yeah. each other. So. I'm pretty sure next week, not this upcoming weekend, but the following, if if Michigan, Michigan, or if Michigan, Ohio State, and Penn State all win next week, they'll be they'll be Michigan, Michigan State would be like four and five, and Ohio mm-hmm. State, Penn State, they'll be those two games. They'll everyone will be in the top ten. They'll be crazy. yeah, yeah. I mean that that's that's the thing is. It, I agree with you, Adam. I really think you can only pencil in Georgia and Cincinnati at this point. And I think there's going to probably be another four teams that are fighting for those last two spots. Um, but it sounds like, especially in the Big Ten, I think it's going to sort itself out because all these uh, high-ranking teams yeah, have to play, play each, each other. other. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that's very segues, exciting and interesting to see. That segues nicely into a team that's probably not going to get in now. No. The spoiler makers. Here's the, the upset here. Yep. The spoiler makers go to Iowa city and put a thumping. It wasn't just a fluke uh, look past week. I mean, they, they, they beat Iowa pretty that was so- a soundly. That was a yeah. statement. So I think Iowa's got a top 10, top five ranked defense, but an unranked offense. And that's the problem. Oh, yeah. their offense is like, they couldn't go up against North Dakota state. Yeah. It's seven on seven. I mean, like w- just when we didn't think the Iowa's offense could hit a new low, it it, it just went out and, and hit that low. Yeah, it was just a matter of time before the defense couldn't carry them anymore. Right. Um, yeah, and it I just mean, happened to be against Purdue, who was on. I, I, I didn't get to watch this game um live, but I've I, I watched um an extended um highlights, and honestly, it was just a lot of three and outs on Iowa. Um, Petrus ended up throwing four interceptions at, by the end of the game, but a yeah, lot of I, those I were kind of, yeah, towards the end trying to make it in. And Purdue's wide receiver had 240 yards receiving. So Bell. they yeah, was all over the place. Whatever Purdue did against that defense, I think everyone else that has to play Iowa is going to take notes on it yeah. because that's impressive. So I, I have one, one topic that I wanted to bring up that kind of relates back to our conversation the past few weeks about Michigan. Mm-hmm. So Purdue in this win over number two ranked Iowa had, they rotated three quarterbacks throughout this whole game, the whole game. And it wasn't, it was planned that way. It wasn't an injury. Wow. It, wasn't, it wasn't anything. They just wanted to rotate their quarterbacks out and it worked. So yeah. with that being said, like, wait, that hold, kind on. Of, hold what's on. That? Three quarterbacks. Yeah. Three. 
what do they do? Because normally you have a, a quarterback spare passing. They all did everything, honestly. Run, really? I mean, I mean, I'm sure they all have. I, I don't know all these players, like, ins and outs, but they were doing everything. Some were running it, some were throwing, mostly throwing, but they were doing it all, yeah. And I think that was kind of what wow. caught Iowa off guard. So going back to the Michigan thing with a five-star freshman quarterback, when you're playing him, like, yeah, you're burning his year, but that could make a difference. And, and clearly it worked for Purdue. I'm not saying it's going to work for Michigan or, or that's going to be a game changer, but you got to have these guys ready. I mean, I've heard of running back by committee, the quarterback. No, by this committee. was quarterback. And they, <laughs> they kept highlighting it in the whole second half. They kept highlighting it, saying how this was strange, but they, they at least admitted to it and said, yeah, we're going to do this. We're going to change these guys out. We're going to keep them on their toes. I mean, that might be the new, I mean, there's something that comes along and like innovates college offense every couple of years, you know, well, and, think like, about a it, yeah. true every run, position, every other position, committee. they get swapped out yeah. throughout the game. Yeah. So why not quarterback? I mean, not uh, maybe it's the right decision for some teams. Maybe it's not, it could work. It yeah. could not, but depends yeah, I mean, your, so your personnel. Many, so many, you know, pundits will say like, you don't want to switch up the quarterback and mess, messes with the flow. Like sure. that might be overrated. I mean, I think like depends on the player. Like, if your team, if your players can throw the ball, they can run a, they can run an offense and they each offer like their own unique skill sets. Like there's something to be said for putting that yeah. in throughout the and, game. And if you have a running quarterback, like what it typically is, I feel like it's a running quarterback and a passing quarterback. Like that's kind of what you see. But if you have three of them, like they yeah. all obviously can, can kind of do it all. So yeah. that's, and the coolest part was that they were all like happy for each other. It didn't look like, I mean, they were, uh, it's a little different when you're playing the number two ranked team in the country and, and beating them, but they were all like genuinely seemed happy for each other. When they came off the field, they're like hugging and high fiving and, and yeah, yeah, it, it's, it looked pretty cool. I mean, I know it's, that you yeah, can give a defense fits too. If you line one of those quarterbacks up out, like as a receiver, that's like, yeah. well, who knows what could happen, you know? And if they, if they got wheels, you know, like, cause I'll be able to line Jalen hurts up wide. And it's like, well, you have, you have no idea what's going to happen. Cause that guy could run too. I mean, sure. so yeah. That's yeah, awesome. That's, that's interesting. Yeah. Cause I, obviously I know O'Connell kind of took over for Jake, the snake uh, plumber. Yeah. And, so that, uh, and that's how I realized it first. Cause plumber and, and O'Connell were both kind of like, in and i was like yeah. what, what's going on maybe one got hurt but then they actually touched on it the i don't remember who was doing the game but they commented on it that no they've got a three-man quarterback yeah, team I, i'm surprised i didn't i mean i obviously i guess i know those two i, I didn't know that <laughs> i don't guy. know the name of the third yeah but they had three of them all i know is that makes the spartans trip to west lafayette after michigan look way worse than i thought it was gonna be it's kind of like you're looking at like okay you know you know if the spartans go nine and three lose to you know michigan ohio state penn state that's fine Purdue's they pick ranked up the, now. They're the other two teams are purdue and in, in maryland and uh, you know i was like okay purdue hasn't really been that great but well <laughs> guess that, uh, that changes now um yeah uh very disappointing for Iowa fans. I'm sure we're actually going to have an Iowa fan on the pod uh, next week. Well, uh, interesting to see what his uh, thoughts are on this. They're probably not going to be very positive, but <laughs> no. So um, it's Plummer, O'Connell, and Burton, Austin Burton. Burton. Just to just to throw a little respect on his name. <laughs> well, respect. Thank I you. I love it, man. Well, I'm definitely going to have to watch some Purdue football. I haven't admittedly not watched them much. Um, well, you're not going to be the you know the the top. You're not going to be quarterback you with only Ooh. one quarterback playing. That is Ooh. true. Those spoiler true. makers are known for having quarterbacks. Interesting. Um, all right. Another game here. Another upset. Uh, LSU beat Florida and took money out of Mike's pocket directly. A lot of money. Significant, A lot of money. Significant amount. And of money. then the shocker of it all is Coach O is out. Coach yeah, that's o what's is, crazy. Is getting immediately on Tinder and just move, moving on from football for now. Um, yeah, that's crazy. I, I Tyrion Davis, Davis Price. I just want to say, um, I, I don't like you. I don't like you and what you did to my bank account. I don't even like it a little bit. Just, I mean, <laughs> I, I get you're doing it for Coach O, but like that guy that stinks. Um, I, I hate to trash talk coach Joe, but like after reading that athletic article today, did you guys see that? Have you seen that? Have you heard about that? No. Yeah. Coach Joe was just bringing girlfriends to practice. And if they had kids, he was letting the kids like do drills. 
So like, imagine that, like you're trying to get ready for like Auburn and little Timmy, 10 year old Timmy is like in the tackling dummy, dummy in front of you. I'd it's, drop him. Yeah, right. Timmy's right. getting laid out. Yeah. The article pretty much centered around the fact that once Ordron got his money, um, his priorities kind of shifted a little bit away from football to personal things. I still don't think necessarily that's the reason why he got fired. Personal he got fired because they stink. Um, but yeah, huge opening now. You got uh, uh, Coach O was <laughs> the second highest paid um, coach in college football. So they obviously have the funds uh, to, to bring um, who they want there. And uh, it'll be interesting to see who fills these huge uh, coaching vacancies in USC and LSU, both probably a top five. Hope they bring somebody in from UCLA. <laughs> Chip. If it, if it is because he stinks, though, I mean, he went undefeated and won a national championship two years ago. Like, that's Correct. kind of yeah, very your LSU. Recent. Like, have a little bit of patience. Like, come on. But they've looked horrible in arguably – the second best no, division you know was, in college football. No, you know what was in the athletic article? They said that he hit on the pregnant wife of someone on LSU's board of directors, and she said, "I'm married and, I, and I'm pregnant." And he's like, so "Why does that matter?" Was his reaction? And I think that that is the reason Mike, why. He who got was canned. the coach prior to that? Well, I for mean, years and years and years, and when what happened to him? Well, yeah, well, but the Mad Hatter. I, I don't. I think they have a, a pretty. Are you talking high about Nick Saban? Um, no, they, the Mad Hatter. Yeah, Les Miles. They had. A, they have a pretty high threshold or threshold for uh, scumbag. Threshold. <laughs> yeah. Sure. <laughs> um, so I, I, I don't know. Yes, I'm sure this article is juicy. I have a feeling that if this team was winning, I don't think they would care. I think high, it was speaking of high thresholds. They stay. Urban Meyer in a Friday night in Cincinnati. Boom. That's who I did there. Boom. Um, okay. A couple other quick upsets here. We had Auburn uh, beat Arkansas. Uh, Bo Nix finally looked good on the road. Blew him out. Wasn't even close. Um, Baylor destroyed Baylor. Baylor destroyed BYU. Excuse me. Um, slide for the Mormons continue. I know they're really injured. It's kind of a tough situation for them but they're kind of still at least putting their names out there for all these uh you know prospects once they do move into uh the big 12 uh which will be really big for them to kind of yeah be help interesting them to see how they recruit when they say oh yeah by the way you gotta go on a mission trip for five years and then uh we'll get you a starting wide receiving job yeah, it'll be uh, interesting. I don't know that it's necessary, though. Uh, I don't think it's required. I know a lot of um, a lot of recruits go there because it is highly sponsored by uh, the Church of Jesus Christ for Latter Day Saints. But um, I don't think it's an absolute like you have to do it um, if you go there. I think it's just a lot of people find value in it. Could you imagine going on that mission trip and you come back and now you know? BYU's in the Big 12, they'd be getting some some better players, and you just, you know, leave a girlfriend behind, and you come back, and, well, girlfriend is now married to an NFL football player, <laughs> and, uh, yep, that's it for you, pal. And she's drinking pop. She's drinking it, soda now. Caffeine. It, uh, yeah, she, caf- she caffeine. She has changed. Is, it's actually interesting. So my, my boss um, is a huge BYU fan. Uh, he's a Mormon born and raised in Utah, uh, went to BYU. And it was always interesting, big football fan to hear him talk about, um, just the recruiting classes and how they have to take into account, uh, these players being gone for these two year missions. Um, a lot of them and whether they do that to begin with, or they do that middle of the way and just how they try to stagger some of these, uh, trips. Do you have to do it no matter what, if you go to BYU, I don't think so. I really don't. I, I, I just did, um, for work reasons, um, some, uh, research into this school and I, it's not required. I think again, like if you're picking schools, a lot of people that go to BYU pick it because you're Mormon and you, you want to be a part of that experience, but I don't think it is necessary, hmm. which is interesting. Hmm. Um, and then the other upset is another PAC 12, uh, ASU, uh, went to Utah, which is Utah is probably one of only two, maybe three, um, real, hostile environments in the Pac-12 and uh, 
they uh, unfortunately lost and are kind of losing their their grip on the Pac-12 South. And ultimately, this really now, they were the only other one-loss team in the Pac-12 um, beside Oregon, and now it's really Oregon's probably the only one that has a real shot at the playoff. Yeah. Um, but, you know, they still have to – they had a shaky game against Cal. They still have to get through the rest of their schedule too. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we will see. And then just uh, hit on, since we've been talking about all this gambling, again, don't forget, send us your bets, please. We need help. Mike really needed your help this weekend. I had a, a decent weekend uh, betting-wise, but please, even if you aren't going to place the bet yourself, but you feel really confident about something, let us know. I tell you what, though, there's there's nothing quite – I, I got to say some of the, I don't know what is happening to me in the morning, but like the past two weeks I have been just, I've gotten shelled in the noon games. And then, <laughs> you know, you when you up. put so many bets out there, like there's all kinds of opportunities for crazy things to happen. Then somehow I wake up in the morning and things are okay. You know, not so bad. I don't, I don't know what happens in those late games, but uh shout out Nevada. I will say that. And uh shout out uh, UTSA. Those guys have been a lock for me, but now they're ranked. So they'll probably, you know, screw that up somehow, but we're going to ride with the road runners. Meet me. All right. You heard it here. All right, guys, why don't we transition to the games we're looking forward to this weekend? In addition to the George Jewett trophy, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. Um, so what yeah. games are interesting you guys? Yeah. 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 So I uh, am quite looking forward to Clemson and Pitt. It's a bit of a uh, role reversal because normally Pitt is the one playing spoiler for Clemson. Um, Pickett, though, I mean, that guy seems like the real deal. So uh, that's going to be an interesting game. Uh, we'll see what can happen there. It's at Pitt, n- you know, notoriously hostile environment at Heinz Field uh, on Sundays anyways. Uh, and then they have about, you know, a dozen or, or so fans that show up on Saturdays. <laughs> yeah, not so much uh, on so, Saturdays. Yeah, so that should be uh, – I, I'm going to watch it. I'm going to cheer for the Panthers. You know, we'll see what happens, but yeah, Pitt, um, you know, it, it'll be an interesting game no matter what. Uh, but then really, I mean, the other games I'm excited for uh, two unranked home teams are favored against top 10 teams. So number 10, Oregon goes to UCLA and UCLA is favored by two and a half. And then number eight, Oklahoma state, who we were talking about earlier, Mike Gundy and his Tennessee waterfall, are heading to Iowa State, and Iowa State's favored by a touchdown and extra point. Incredible. I, I was shocked when I saw that line. Yeah, that's that's something to keep an eye out for because, again, a lot of people aren't sure on Oklahoma State, and I guess they don't believe in Texas either. Um, but, yeah, again, now it's Iowa State playing spoiler. I don't know what situation they are in, if they can well, uh, make a run or not. But Hey, Brees Hall ain't heard no bell. I mean, oh, he no. had a hell of a week this past week. So, I mean, he's still playing hard. So we'll see what happens here. But I was just, that line really surprised me. Uh, but it'll be a good matchup. Oklahoma State's defense, I can't believe I'm saying it, against Iowa State's, you know, and Brees Hall. So we'll see what happens there. Yeah, definitely. Joe, what do you think? I've got a sleeper that I'm, I'm interested in, and, and it's kind of for a little bit for the – kind of the media look at it, but LSU Ole Miss, uh, like LSU that. coming off the Florida win, coming off the news about Coach O, Ole Miss, I, I mean, I think EJ and I are both on kind of corral watch for the Lions, <laughs> see what he looks like. So I don't know. I, mean, I think that's one that I'm, I'm interested to see. I think Ole Miss will win, but I think it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. Well, Where, Where's that game at? This one's at, it's in Oxford. Okay. What is LSU going to do now that uh, Coach O is officially gone too? That's interesting. They're going to, yeah, they're, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I just saw something on, on Twitter that there's some early candidates, but uh, yeah, is this Lane no, I mean, one of them was Lane Kiffin? Yeah, yeah, to put his name in the uh, hat because they can pay him a lot more in Baton Rouge than they can in Oxford. And if those kids are, you know, I mean, obviously, I think the part of the reason why they they knocked off Florida is that they wanted to make a statement for Coach O. But like, I mean, you know, it's easy to say win one for the Gipper, you know, when when Coach O's out the door. So I mean, that's going to be an interesting game. But I mean, if you thought LSU Florida was his shootout, then I mean, this 
you know, Matt Corral and Lane Kiffin, they'll they'll have the he'll have the Rebs ready to play. So. And that's a three thirty game on Saturday. Okay, that's a great three thirty game. Great. Then we have USC at Notre Dame. That is a rivalry game for the jeweled shillelagh. So that's a future episode alert here. Uh, it's a it's a it's a wonderful rivalry. The trophy itself is very unique and very expensive. So uh, I recommend you at least take a look at it at the uh, the end of the game if you don't want to watch the entire game. But yeah, I love that rivalry. Cross country rivalry. I used to yeah. argue. It's like the like the Reggie Bush like yeah. where they like hell yeah they pushed him into the end zone from behind like that. <laughs> That one brings back some memories. That's Hell yeah. Non Heisman winner, Reggie Bush. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we can't, we can't endorse that here. Yeah. Give Reggie uh, his trophy back. Damn it. Yeah. And if anyone's a big Mac fan, you got to watch the West action, Division. some Mac action, my alma mater at CMU taking on Northern Illinois. So oh, there you go. Yeah. Northern Illinois, I think is four and oh in the conference cmu's three and one so big game in mount pleasant michigan this weekend are you going oh yeah no i was up there this last weekend so had a hell of a time i Uh, saw those pictures yeah dude mount pleasant michigan i've never been heaven on earth heaven on earth if you went to central Uh, (laughs) probably not a whole lot else to do if you didn't go to central yeah you you don't have memories to relive um yeah you probably don't need to go but that'll be a good game one yeah, of my... you got Rocky uh, Lombardi playing for the the Huskies there, right? Uh, yeah. Has Has Central played Western yet? Because Western's obviously no. I don't think we good. played Western yet. Um, but yeah, we got Jim McElwain, head coach, came over from from Michigan after he was there for a little while, and yeah, I've got a redshirt freshman at uh, running back NQB. I think there's only one senior on the whole offensive uh, squad. So oh, wow, young team. Uh, yeah, the future's bright for the Chippewas. So, so Adam, as a uh, as a Central Michigan alum, there's a a video a video that I remember, like right whenever um, like bowl announcements and stuff like that started to go viral. Yeah. I don't know if, if you remember this, but there's a video of the uh, the locker room, like they're they're big, they're, not the locker room, they're like big meeting room, and they're yeah. announcing Central Michigan's bowl, and they're yeah. like, there's a, a bunch. Of, do you remember this? I don't, I don't know. There's like 10 of them up on the screen and the Jeopardy music's playing and they start taking away like one here and there. And the last two are the Hawaii bowl oh, and yeah. like the tire bowl, like the yeah. in Detroit. Right. Oh, I think it was like the, the little Caesars pizza, pizza bowl. Yeah. 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 It was, it was, ter- it, it was in Detroit and yeah. Hawaii. And then the screen cuts to black and the room goes dark and the players are all yelling. And then you hear, um, Kokomo by the Beach Boys, Aruba, yeah. Jamaica, and then it's just a whole like h- highlight of Hawaii, and the, oh, they yeah. just freak out that oh, they got the Hawaii Bowl. So that's so great. <laughs> yeah, they're lucky because I wouldn't be surprised just regionally if they're like, oh yeah, just put them in Detroit. That'll be a yeah easy <laughs> thing logistically, <laughs> right? Well, I think the MAC championships <laughs> always in Detroit. So if you can if you can elevate beyond uh, and and qualify for something higher, I think. Uh, you get to go somewhere cool. Oh, sorry, the Bahamas Bowl. I'm gonna I'm gonna try to find that. That was 2014 Bahamas Bowl. Yeah, I'm gonna try to find that the announcement there. Uh, um, the who, who won? That was uh, that was you guys against the Hilltoppers. Who won? All right, I'm gonna try to find that video and let's okay. let's see just for posterity. Oh, a close. Oh, the Chippewas lost in a heartbreaker, 49 to 48. Oh, but wow. they still got to go to the Bahamas as opposed to, uh, as opposed <laughs> Detroit. to Detroit. So <laughs> yeah. driving to Detroit. Yeah, they enjoyed themselves. <laughs> Papa um, has Bahamas Bowl. Papa has sponsor talent. See, that also sucks too, because if you get a really good sponsor, you get like free stuff, right? So what's Popeye's giving you? Like you if you go to like the Belkin, you know, whatever <laughs> bowl it is, they'll give you some like electronics and stuff. Like you get some pretty sick things. <laughs> Yeah, pop electronics go electronics go out of date like every year. <laughs> Chick, chicken sandwiches never go out of style. <laughs> never, never go out of style. That's hilarious. Um, all right, guys, why don't we uh talk about the trophy then? Why don't we uh transition into the the meat of this uh episode here? So today we are talking about the George Jewett trophy. This trophy is given to the winner between the Northwestern Wildcats and the Michigan Wolverines. So let me hit you guys with a couple of fun facts here. So this is the newest trophy in the Big Ten, with this being its inaugural year. 
which is very interesting. Brand new. Uh, this is also the only rivalry trophy in the Big Ten that is named after a real person, because Paul Bunyan is not a real person. And Says you. <laughs> according to a release from the two programs, this is the uh, this trophy is the first one in um, FBS history to be named after a black player, uh, which I thought was pretty interesting too. I guess there's a couple um, that are named um, in FCS, but not FBS, uh, which is uh, interesting. Very cool. Yeah. All right, guys. So uh, why don't you guys scroll a little bit here and give me uh, the first impressions of uh, the trophy. Um, I wasn't able to paste the picture in it, so I had to put a link. Oh, we, oh, we got to click a link. I'm sorry. I, it wouldn't let me do it. Help. Oh, you son of a bit. Why would you do this? Why would you do this? Here. Mike, why don't you just describe Not it? live on air. Not Rick Astor. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, guys, like 2015 called. Uh, I Rick rolled them. I yeah, cannot it's... believe this. I can't. <laughs> believe, now, now I got to watch the whole thing. I just, I can't turn it off. Those um, ginger locks. Oh, we. We got at least. Yeah, what hair he had? Kinda, you can kind of faintly hear it. Uh, so the reason I rickrolled you guys is because no one knows what this trophy looks like yet. Uh, it's actually going to oh, be really? a surprise. Okay. Uh, and they're going to um, display it uh, for the first time when the game happens. What am I looking at? I'm, I'm Are you sure? Yeah, because I, I saw the little banner Mock-ups? things. Yeah, with with his face in in like an old school looking thing. But um, from all the reports that I saw, that the trophy hadn't been um, shown yet, and then players and coaches were excited to. Oh, uh, so it's just a mock up that we got here to see what it looks like. Huh. He's a good least, looking guy, unless, George Stewart. I will say though, I this research is as of what's today, Monday. Of last was seven hours ago. ago. Okay. Oh, so there out. could be okay. I was gonna say there could be updates. Yeah, I think it I think I, I think I just posted it in there too. I think it's looking pretty dope. There you go. Oh it, well if holy it, wow. Okay. Grass. He looks why don't you guys describe it then? I mean, oh all right. So um you know, George Stewart is standing prominently at the top of the trophy there's a, a bag behind him looks like a doctor bag almost um and he is wearing like the old time you know football bottom like he has on you know cleats and uh you know his football pads his pants but then the top he looks extremely stately he has Long like old. a uh, yeah like a nice like vest on and then a killer jacket like that's that's a nice looking jacket right there yeah, yeah there's certain different. jackets that that i really enjoy like uh Blade Runner 2049 is a good jacket. Uh, drive. Basically, anything Ryan Gosling's in is a good jacket that I want to own. But George Hewitt's <laughs> jacket looks fantastic here. So he's got some books in his left hand. What else it, do we know about George Hewitt? Anything? Oh, I will fill you in on who so George for, Hewitt was. For the looks, this says it's 36 inches tall. The actual base can pivot dependent on upon which team wins the trophy. Get out! For the games, cool. you will... You will well, this says before the games, uh, this side will be seen, whichever team won it last year. So he'll be Get facing out. the team that won, and it does turn, yeah. That's awesome. That's that's, that's really very cool. cool. I know, like, obviously you guys said that this happened today. I guess that makes sense that they introduced it this week. Um, but yeah, prior to ago, this, yeah. yeah, we did not know what it would look like, and, oh, yeah, this looks awesome. Well, uh, what's well, up well, the how the trophy tables turn. So it looks like we have the school logos on both, uh, like the front and the back. And then that's how you turn it to, to the logo. That's one. Yeah. And then what's on the sides. Can we make it out? I think it's just got details on George Jewett is okay. birth and death year and some details. So his, in his look, it says in terms of the actual person, it's a football uniform from the 1890s that we were able to find a picture as well as a lab coat that goes over top with books, a football, and a medical kit. Very cool. Oh, because it, it does say on the one side, it says scholar and athlete. Yeah, it says it has all of what basically incorporates what he did in his life. 
EJ, what did he do in his life? Yes, this is actually very cool because I was going to play a game with you guys um, later was what do you think it should look like based on what um, information I gave you about his life? And I don't want to spoil it for you, but I think they got it right. Um, I, I think they definitely got it right. Um, okay, so why don't we uh, get into the history of the rivalry and then I'll talk uh, tell you a little bit about George Jude himself and why the trophy um, looks the way it does. So the first matchup between these two schools was in 1892 uh, in which Northwestern won 10 to 6. Uh, and then uh, unfortunately, like a lot of these, it's actually kind of surprising. I feel like a lot of the teams that uh, historically haven't been, done good in a series usually win the first couple matchups. Um, but Michigan won the next three. And then ultimately the overall series between the two schools, Michigan leads uh, 58 wins to 15 losses to two ties. Uh, so it is uh, obviously very dominant series. Well, uh, not surprising. Someone said. Right. Um, yes, but you'll be surprised. There actually are some very uh, interesting games uh, over the history, uh, over the years between these two schools that I was not aware of. Um which is kind of cool. But so typically this next segment, I kind of tell you guys what life was like when this trophy was created. Um, however, since this trophy is being created in 2021 and we are currently here, I think you guys are very well aware of what life is like now. So I thought we'd do something a little different. So why don't we guys, why don't we play a game that I'm going to call either or. So I'm going to show you guys a, a series of pictures and you tell me which one you like better. All right, let's do it. Just a couple. All right. So the first ones, if you guys want to scroll down. So yeah. number one, would you choose either all grape jerseys or all maize jerseys? All grape. When all maize. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, all maize. So I'm not a big, big fan of purple. This, I am not a it's big fan of purple. It's a color of royalty. It is. I'm not royal. I yeah. really don't like the all maze, but the quarterback in this picture has the blue like Under Armour under it, and I think that yeah. makes it look better. Oh yeah, that does look better. Yeah, you're right versus about that. Just who is that? I don't know um, who that is. Uh, I'm not is that sure. Like John O'Corn or something? Or yeah, or something like yeah. Uh, what was the quarterback like three years ago? Right before Brandon Peters, he was the backup to. Uh, Shoot. I'm not sure. I actually should have probably looked at that. I'll look it up. All right. So we got, we got th three mazes and one grape. Well, I, I do. I mean, look, I'm not a big purple, fan of purple. is the color of royalty and the, yeah, the okay. white helmets look clean with it. In my opinion, I think with the all maze, it's just a little bit too much yellow. I feel like I'm watching color rush and uh, not that all purple is much better. So I didn't <laughs> myself any favor on that <laughs> argument there. But uh, yeah, I don't know. It, like, but that oppressive color rush, like the color rush that really you just want to rinse your eyes out. Like, uh, oh gosh, I think it's a John Jacksonville's. Oh, terrible. I, I will say at least this maze, uh, which is a shade of yellow for the listeners that don't know what maze is, um, is not. Our listeners a, are smart. They, at they least know. it's not like highlighter yellow. It's yeah. you know, at least like more of like a sunflower type yellow. Yep, it's John O'Corn. Oh, right. Johnny. Uh, maze a little, is a uh, word for corn too. So there you go. He's doing uh, like a little rascals kind of, uh, you know, movement there with his, his hand spanky. calling the play. Yeah. yeah. All right. So number two here, would you choose either Michigan striped jerseys or Northwestern striped Jersey? Michigan these two pictures, Michigan by a mile. If, if it was striped anywhere, but the shoulder pads, that would look terrible, but I also like their big block numbers. That looks really good. Uh, Northwestern striped jerseys, uh, just that that's just, that's atrocious. I mean, Grant, I'm not seeing it on a player. I'm just seeing it here, but, uh, yeah, that looks terrible. So Michigan, not, not a big fan of either really. No, they're both pretty weird. I'm going to go, I'm going to go Northwestern on this one. I think it looks like a weird old, like varsity sweater in like, like a, a really ugly, but cool. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, like, an ugly, like, like, let's make this thing look ridiculous. <laughs> um, yeah, you're yeah, you're not gonna pick up a lot of ladies walking around with that thing on, but it's pretty <laughs> it's pretty interesting and two points for interesting. I, I'm going northwestern there. The Michigan God. Wolverines look like Wolverine though with those stripes. Yeah, that's I true. That's true. I Joe, think northwestern. 
Uh, you're I don't know, the bumblebees. Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I actually, I'm not. And that's kind of the point here. I tried to pick two not so great looking jerseys from either school to make it a little harder. Um, I'm not a fan of the Argyle look. Like it's kind of like you know we're smarter than you and we know type feel from what I mean, Northwestern. That's not Argyle, but well, you know, it's like okay. that's what it reminds me though is that kind of like Argyle old person looking like I don't know. Well, to be fair, Northwestern like players Michigan's probably are more. smarter than most. Yeah. They don't need to talk about it, though. So they don't need to boast it. All right, so the last one here. Which player would you want on your team? Either Jim Harbaugh or Pat Fitzgerald. Both are alums of the schools that they uh, they coach at currently. Patty Fitz. He's looking he's mean looking <laughs> he in those look figures. Mean. I think I think Fitzgerald and Harbaugh have on the same size shoulder pads in these pictures. Yeah, just to show how far quarterback shoulder pads have come. Oh, dude, how do you throw the ball with those on? I don't know. Holy you cow! Don't you only throw it seven yards at a time? <laughs> right. Yo, Northwestern should bring back these jerseys. That's mean with the N on the shoulder and the Wildcat on the end. Oh, that's yeah, mean. That's I like that. Yeah, I like I'm, that a lot. I'm going to say, although I will give Jim credit, because like you guys are saying, his shoulder pads are huge, so he didn't throw it a ton. He probably ran it as well. Um, I mean, Fitz, Fitzgerald has, you know, the the cowboy collar on. Just lo- looks like a, a middle linebacker from his era. I say um, this, although, I wouldn't want to tell Pat Fitzgerald that I'm choosing Jim Harbaugh over him. <laughs> yeah. That would not end well for me. Yeah, no, I definitely, uh, definitely think though, uh, Harbaugh looked, uh, I tried to find some pictures where, cause he doesn't look like what a quarterback looks like nowadays. Like he, he looks no. a little tougher than, than the current cream of, uh, quarterbacks in the league. So, yeah. uh, but Fitzgerald looks like he'll like rip your face off. Fitzgerald does. looks like the guy from, uh, the replacements when he <laughs> sees red. And he just... <laughs> Danny. Yeah. Get the What's football for me, Danny. Uh, John, uh, Favreau. Yeah, the fab man in a great role. Yeah, no, that's that's exactly that's exactly right. All right, cool. So it looked like a few more Fitzgerald uh, picks there uh, than Harbaugh. Um, very interesting. All right, but that's all I got for you on that segment. I was I, I was trying to find something different. There were a couple other jerseys, but I like that segment. Bring it back. Mi- that's Michigan. That's a good one. Request Michigan doesn't a, uh... deviate very often from their jerseys because they're just classics um and northwestern has some like child looking jerseys so those were that was the, that was the best that i could do i tried to i, I was gonna do um fight songs but that those are like heavily copyrighted and i kind of want this episode to stay on the various platforms um so because all, all these fight songs from these schools are pretty silly. If you look at the lyrics and the names for them, uh, which is interesting. But well, I mean, they were, I mean, man, when they were made, yeah, old, old, olds. Okay, so why don't we pivot back to the origins of this trophy? Um, so on February twenty fifth uh, of this year, twenty twenty one. Uh, the University of Michigan and Northwestern announced that they would be creating a rivalry trophy starting this year, named after George Jewett, who was the first African American to play football at each institution. Um, and actually the first black player in the history of the Big Ten Conference. Really? Uh, which was very, yeah, which was very cool. Um, so this trophy, like I had mentioned, marks the, the first rivalry uh, game trophy named for an African American player in um, FBS history. Um, and that's a, that's a picture of, of George there, um, that I, that I put in the notes. Good looking guy. Yes. Good looking guy, George Hewitt, you know, nose is also very straight, which I feel like when you played football back in that day, your nose would get massacred, but like he has a, he has a very, very good, like he doesn't look like a guy who played football at a time where I feel like your face would get busted up all the time. If yeah, anything, like he, he looks like he'd be like uh, too pretty, too pretty to play football, but no I, cages. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. All right. So let me give you guys some information on George Jewett, which will probably sh- shed some light on, on why the trophy looks like it does. Uh, so Jewett was a valedictorian and a star athlete at Ann Arbor high school, which is now 
uh, Ann Arbor Pioneer. And for people that aren't familiar, uh, Pioneer literally shares a parking lot with, with the big house. Uh, so it's about as close as you can get to um, being at Mis Michigan University without being at Michigan University. And he participated in track, football, and baseball. Um, so he played for Michigan during the 1890 and 1892 seasons uh, as a fullback and a halfback. Um, but he also was the team's main kicker all while studying medicine. All while also playing baseball and basketball. Holy cow. Yes. So he was a jack of all trades. Um, so in 1893, he transferred to Northwestern to finish his medical degree. And he played two seasons for the Wildcats after that. Who's dead? Yes, um, definitely. And then after college, he became a doctor in Chicago uh, before returning to Ann Arbor, where he had several businesses. And again, putting this all in perspective, especially with the time period, is such a major achievement, especially for an African-American uh, man during those times to be able to accomplish all of this is just outstanding. Um, and he hold actually... On, hold on a second. He... Hold on. He, wait a second, 1870 to 1908. So he had a relatively, he died relatively, I mean, I guess maybe not for the times, but this guy played three sports, excelled at all of them. Well, I don't know about baseball and basketball, but if you're the starting like fullback and the kicker, like you're doing pretty good at football. You became a doctor, you went to Chicago, came back to Ann Arbor, opened a bunch of businesses, did all of that. In what, 1970 to, or 1870 yep. to 1908, 38 years? 38? Yes. 38 years he did all that? So he also coached briefly at both Michigan Agricultural Get College. Get out of here. Which turned into Michigan State. The Fawns? Yes, the, the Fawns. Fawns and the Staters um, and Olivet College. Um, but unfortunately, he died suddenly in 1908 at the age of 38. So yes, he, he unfortunately um, did not live a long life, but he did a lot in the life that he had. Holy cow. Imagine if this guy was around the, at the start of World War I. He probably would have ended it by himself after the first week. Holy yeah. cow. Ridiculous. I, and found, I, I found the picture where like his the headshot you've got, like the yes. larger picture that that's sourced from, he's the only one that doesn't look like a complete and utter tool in that photo. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, get me out of here. These jackasses are like laying all over. He each does. Other. Oh my gosh. I just pulled it up. Yeah, they're laying. <laughs> they're like all lounging over. on each other. Like it's in like some, like, I don't even know, some cigar lounge. It's like a bunch of guys like laying all over each other. And he's like, damn it, get me out of here. <laughs> he's like, bro, I have it. I have like a dissertation to write and right. businesses yeah. to start. Like, get out of here it's a very funny photo <laughs> <laughs> some nice they, mustaches in this photo too they do look like a bunch of schlubs <laughs> compared to him though yeah he's like get me get me out of this group wow also something that i thought was pretty cool um there, there's believe it or not uh, a connection between uh jewett and uh coach jim harbaugh um, which I thought was pretty interesting. So uh, Michigan's coach, Jim Harbaugh, was interviewed earlier this year about the trophy, and he said he remembers Jewett's grandson, uh, whose name was Coleman, was an assistant principal at Tappan Middle School in Ann Arbor uh, when Harbaugh was a student. Uh, so uh, Coleman Jewett, who unfortunately passed away in uh, 2013, apparently once told Harbaugh when Harbaugh was struggling in Spanish class that great athletes who struggle in school become hometown heroes because they don't have the grades to become more. Oh, Jeez. <laughs> that, that's what this grandson of George Jewett uh, said to, uh, to, to Harbaugh, uh, which I thought was uh, crazy. Um, but Harbaugh said of the trophy itself, he said, uh, uh, George Jewett to, to have this game, this trophy, I think it's a tremendous addition for his legacy, for the family's legacy, and also for the Big Ten, for college football, for Michigan, for Northwestern, for everybody. I'm extremely excited about it. Can't wait to see what the trophy looks like. So that's what uh, Jim had to say earlier in the year when they, uh, they made this announcement. Yeah, that's a cool trophy. Yeah. So now, and that's what I was going to have you guys at, like based on that, what do you think it should look like? 
and now that we, you know, they, they announced it today and, and showed it, I, I think it, I think they really hit the the nail on the head there. I think they did a really good job. Um, it looks pretty, it looks really cool. Yeah. He looks like he, uh, he knows he deserves that spot. And he's, <laughs> I, I like that they've kind of incorporated both his uh, medical and football accolades into that trophy. Yeah. It's really cool. Yeah, I agree. I, I think it'll be interesting to see what, what I, I'm always curious to see how big these trophies are. Um, it's hard to tell from these photos, but uh, would I, you I, say it was 36 inches tall? Yeah, 36 it's inches. Awesome. But then does that mean there's a base? Is there no base? Is it like the Paul Bunyan? When we, that's I didn't true. even know they had a base. I don't know. So <laughs> yeah, that's um, true. But yeah, 36. I mean, it's decent size. I think it'll be cool to hoist up after whoever wins it and and you can turn the it's it's very cool that you can turn the the figure on it to that face is, whatever team one that is super awesome yeah i feel like that's kind of uh, a similar uh style to like the paul bunyan when the team gets to put the helmet on on paul on paulie b and it's just you know you can kind of make it your own um which is hard to do with a lot of these trophies um which is cool. All right. So the last thing I got for you guys here is uh, some noteworthy games in the series. Now I just want to caveat this up front. Obviously it's a very one-sided event. So any noteworthy games are typically when Northwestern has beat Michigan. This is not my bias. I promise. Um, unfortunately, any noteworthy games that Michigan beats Northwestern, it's like a hundred to nothing. So um, <laughs> these are just a few of these uh, matchups. And, and what I took away from this was I didn't realize how many ranked matchups these schools have had between each other. Um, obviously, you know, Michigan's been ranked numerous times, but I didn't expect Northwestern to be ranked as many times um, in the series as, as they were. So, uh, so let's start off here. The Wildcats won six of the first 13 games. Uh, before Michigan began to dominate the series. So the two programs were co-champions of the Big Ten during the 1926, 1930, and 1931 seasons, uh, which I thought was kind of interesting. So in 1925, Northwestern halted Michigan's march to the national championship with a barn burner 3-2 to two victory on a muddy <laughs> surface at Soldier Field. Um, which is also crazy to think that soldier field has been around since 1925. Right. Um, so the three points scored by Northwestern were the only points allowed by the 1925 Michigan team. And, uh, that coach that we've talked about a couple of times here, fielding Yost called, uh, called that Northwestern team, the greatest football team I ever saw in action. So that's what, that's what, wow. uh, that, that's some high praise. High praise indeed. Now that guy also was a pretty big sore loser, so I don't know if it was just <laughs> he lost yeah, the one Kev's game. Was like, yeah, you want the team that you lose to to be the best, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, but I thought that was pretty interesting too. Uh, so in 1948, the schools met in a top five matchup with Michigan ranked number four and Northwestern ranked number three. And in that game, uh, Michigan forced four turnovers and won it 28 to nothing. And uh, that jumped Michigan to the uh, to number one overall, and that was en route to a national championship for Michigan in 1948. Uh, so that was pretty crazy. I'd never thought Northwestern would be ranked in the top five, um, which was pretty cool. And then the Wildcats uh, kind of returned to prominence under head coach, and I'm going to absolutely butcher this name, Ara Parsegian. Parsegian, yeah. Uh, defeating... He was the coach at uh, Notre Dame. Okay. Uh, so they returned to prominence under him. Uh, they defeated the Wolverines in consecutive games, 1958 and 1959. And then following uh, Parsegian's departure, Michigan won 19 consecutive games uh, between Par the two. Parsegian's the guy that uh, didn't want to play Rudy. Oh. Oh, yeah. Yeah. There you go. No idea. Yeah. Well, there you go. So he was a really good coach. And then as soon as he left, maybe to Notre Dame um, at that point, yep. he, uh, he Michigan... did go to Notre Dame after, after Northwestern. <laughs> Northwestern. Just short trip. Yeah. You know. There you go. Uh, so clearly Michigan then took advantage of, <laughs> of that situation. Uh, and the last thing I got for you guys in 1995, number 25 Northwestern scored 10 unanswered points in the fourth quarter to shock number six, Michigan, 19 to 13. Uh, the Wildcats took advantage of four Michigan uh, turnovers and Pat Fitzgerald led Northwestern with 14 tackles, including two tackles for a loss. 
and that was the first time Northwestern won uh, or beat Michigan in 30 years. And it was the first win in, in Ann Arbor since 1959. Uh, and this upset uh, sprung Northwestern on a path to a 10 to two season, reaching as high as number three in the rankings. Um, and this was the Wildcats first um, Big Ten Conference title since 1936. And they were invited to play in the Rose Bowl for the first time since 1948, in which they lost. But yeah. How are you feeling about that, boys? A lot of history. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'll, I'll, I'll say this. Of all the, the now nine other trophies that we've done, the fact that I was able to find any notable games is more than like half of the trophy games that we've talked about. And I just never expected it to be tweet be between Northwestern and Michigan. Um, I feel like Northwestern's always, I mean, obviously back then in the fifties and even before that is different, but I feel like Northwestern's one of those sneaky teams that always kind of sneaks into the rankings and then surprises people that they're even ranked. So kind of yeah, like, uh, who were we talking about earlier that just snuck in? Uh, was it Purdue? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they're not a pushover team. They're always going to put up a fight. Yeah. I've, I've been to one uh, one Michigan Northwestern game at Ryan Field. It was pretty cool. Oh, yeah. Cool, How is that? Cool surroundings. Heard... Yeah, as I say, it's right off the water, isn't it? Yeah, right in Evanston, north of Chicago. It's like yeah. a beautiful little town. Um, got a, like an Ivy League feel to it. It's really, it's really kind of a, a cool place to watch a game. I was with uh, Denard Robert, Denard Robinson at uh, quarterback, so it was a lot of, a lot of QB sneaks that game, just like running all over the field. <laughs> nice. Fun. Yeah. Yeah, I've I've heard that. That's a um, a pretty cool place to catch a game. Obviously, you're not going to get much of an environment, but I heard it's a, a very, like you said, very cool location. And a, a lot of Michigan town. fans there living in yeah. Chicago, <laughs> packing up one whole quarter of the of the of the stands but yeah it's a cool place to watch a game okay uh so that's gonna do it for us guys um so why don't we why don't we rank this trophy now that we can uh rank it uh that we've seen the picture of it so uh for adam and for the listeners we rank uh looks on a scale from one to five the history uh, on a scale from one to five uh, the rivalry on a scale from one to five and then overall um, whether you'd put this in kind of a bottom tier, a middle tier, or a top tier trophy um, that we've talked about thus far. So who wants to start? I'll go first. All right. So for the looks, I think I'm going to give it a four. I think it's it's beautiful. Um, the fact that it swivels and you can kind of turn it to face whoever won. The one thing that I thought I kind of, I mean, maybe it has it, but we just didn't see it, is that you can keep track of, tallies on there somehow maybe they have it i'm not sure uh but i think that'd be a good addition to it so i'm gonna give it a four for looks history uh i'm also gonna give it a four i think this guy was a badass um did all that stuff before he died at 38 i think that was impressive crazy impressive um so give that a four for history the rivalry i'm going one rivalry it's i don't know it's kind of I don't think when I think rivalry, I don't think Northwestern at all for Michigan. So uh, one and overall, I'm going to say mid, hopefully I'm hoping that it can become a mid, uh, maybe low to mid, but hopefully the rivalry rivalry will build up. Um, but I, I kind of see this similar to uh, the broken chair in the significance and the, the actual trophy has a lot of meaning to it. So I'll, I'll say low to mid, hopefully, hopefully becomes a mid. Okay. Yeah, I'll go next. I'm gonna I'm gonna be really similar to to Joe there. I'm gonna go four on looks. Uh, I think it looks really solid, um, but nothing over the top. Just kind of a nice, sturdy, solid trophy. Um, history gonna go four as well. Uh, I think that guy deserves his trophy, and uh, I think it's it's a really cool story. The fact that he played at both colleges. Rivalry, I'll go a little bit high. I'll go two, just because there's just the proximity. The amount of people living in Illinois from Michigan and, and vice versa, you get a little bit of that, even though the, the history of the game might not be super competitive. And yeah, I'll give it like a, a middle tier overall. Okay, Mike? Yeah, I'm going to go... Um... I'm going to go with you guys. I, I think it's a, it's a four for the looks. I really, 
a lot of things you got the swivel factor like that's really big for me the fact that you can turn that that's yeah. cool and also he he looks great like he looks very stately on there um history uh, i'm gonna give it a five because man like this guy just what what an incredible incredible individual like that is really gives you something to shoot for you know yeah. <laughs> in your life so 38's coming uh, quick yeah, yeah i know i gotta open a couple of businesses get my doctorate no big deal um robbery's a one you know not having lived in the midwest you know i don't i, I don't i don't know that feel but i definitely uh can see you know how it would be a a, a good robbery given that you know the proximity and so many u of m alums there in chicago uh and then overall i'm gonna just say it's it's a low just compare like when you look at it compared to the other ones i, I think it's low for me so okay um i'm gonna go with a, a a four for looks i think based on um the history of him uh i think they they really nailed it with what they incorporated yeah. i was honestly afraid they were just going to use like a picture of his face and I didn't expect them to actually use like a full um, standing figure uh, statue looking uh, look to it, which also makes it very unique because outside of Paul Bunyan, which is obviously like a cartoon character, right. uh, th that doesn't exist. Uh, so I, I think they really nailed it. And again, like the swivel and everything uh, that they incorporated was really cool. I think the history uh, is honestly like a five for me, uh, again, for a lot of the reasons you guys said, and it's just the fact that the, the, the era and his race also has a huge thing to do. True. I mean, it's hard for um, anyone to achieve as much as he did at 38. Uh, and that's without factoring in the era and the race and then the other numerous things he had to deal with to get to where he got, uh, which is incredible. Uh, the rivalry, I think I'm going to go a two kind of like with Adam, just because there were a lot more, while it's not a, a rivalry in the sense of like that, like you, you wouldn't say, Michigan or Northwestern are each other's rivals, but there were more um, close games and interesting games than I thought. Um, so that's why I'll just give it a little bit more of a bump uh, there. And then, yeah, I think I'm with you, Joe. I think it's like a, a bottom of the mid tier for me. And I'm hoping, um, especially with uh, Pat Fitzgerald being at Northwestern, that maybe the games become a little bit more competitive. Um, potentially just for the sake, since this is a trophy now and they're going to, they won't, probably play each other every year because they're on other sides of the division but um hopefully uh this game has a little bit more prominence and i really hope that this trophy gets uh recognized nationally and hopefully it doesn't just kind of get lost in the fray um really hope so because it, it looks sharp and it's a great person to uh to to name it after so yeah i'm excited to see fat Fitzgerald too <laughs> yeah Hey, you know what? I wouldn't call him that or, or that, oh, oh, we didn't even talk about this guys. You, we have to be on, um, a Northwestern watch here, the sideline watch. Oh, we, we got our boy. Muscles McGee. Oh. Muscles <laughs> McGee, the trainer. Do, can, can Strength and conditioning What's coach. His name? I'm not going to lie. I kind of want to see Northwestern win this now just to see him like, bench this thing or curl it or something bench it he doesn't need to bench it he could probably do like he doesn't need to yeah. do anything yeah but he's gonna let's oh, the, what what's the temperature going to be like because that's also good are we are we looking at gloves does and it, a hat does it really matter <laughs> well i mean are we going to get the effect of like him you're not getting gloves? sleeves i'll tell you that <laughs> no sleeves are definitely Quality not with a chance of sleeveless <laughs> <laughs> but are we going to get like a stocking cap and gloves to go with that? Maybe. Oh, that would be I awesome. Hope so. I hope and so. I mean, you know who we're talking about, right? Yeah. I Alex, Alex Spanos. Oh, I knew yeah. it was great. Yeah. Alex Spanos. Yeah. Alex Spanos. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, this might be the last chance that uh, we talk get to talk about Northwestern. So keep an eye out on him because they're going to pan at least once. He'll he'll get his one. Yeah, he'll be on. Them. Maybe yeah. it depends how they do. If they're putting right. up points, they'll show him a few times because he'll be pumping the team up. Definitely. Um, all right. So why don't we get to the preview of this game? So it's the unranked uh, Northwestern Wildcats traveling to uh, where's Michigan ranked now? Number seven, six. six? Okay. Six. Six. Um, six. Uh, to. The Wolverines, they're they're undefeated. It's in Ann Arbor at Michigan Stadium, which is also nicknamed the Big House. Uh, so I have a couple questions for you guys here. Do you guys know what the latest capacity mm. for the Big House is as of 2021? Not me. <laughs> throw, <laughs> throw a guess. 
Not on the nose. One eleven. Uh, I was say, Mike, why don't you go first? Because you guys probably are going to be at least more in the ballpark. Uh, yeah, I mean, like 105 is what I was going to say. Okay, 105. Joe, what do you think? I think it was like 111 or 110, something like that last I heard. Okay. Adam? I'll go, I'll go 111, 500. I'll go the over. <laughs> Ooh, there you go. <laughs> yeah. All right. So according to a website, and again, I, I realize that this is just the official capacity. You could probably cram more if you, you try. It was at 1,000. Um, a hundred and seven thousand six hundred and one. Close so to that. I, thought it, I thought it was higher than that before. So they might have packed more people in it, but their official capacity is that. So where do you guys think that ranks in the world? In the world? Yeah. In the world. Is it like fifth or something like that? Okay. Mike, what do you think? No, no. Like, wait, of any stadium. Any stadium in the world. Ah. Uh, for official capacity or yes. I mean, I, I don't know. I was going to say it's not even close at the top, but I feel like I've seen some crazy numbers, but uh, I, yeah, I, I don't think it's close to the top, but Joe. I'll say top 10. It is top 10. So <laughs> it ranks third in the what? world. Wow. So here's the list starting at 10 Bryant Denny stadium. That is the home of, the Crimson Tide at a hundred. That's why I think it's so low. I just you know, I'm so used to the to the tide. What is what does it hold? Attendees. So uh, Bryant Kenny holds a hundred thousand seventy seven. Uh, so the next number nine. Wait, wait, is, uh, wait that's one, lower than what you just said. One hundred seventy seven thousand or, or what? One hundred thousand seventy seven. Didn't you say yeah. Michigan was one hundred five? One hundred and seven thousand. So okay. it's a Michigan's one hundred and seven. Alabama is a hundred. Hundred, yes. Wait, oh, you said no. Oh, Brian Day is number 10. Yes. Yeah. Okay. They're oh, 10. I thought you said they were one. No, no, I sorry, thought you sorry. said they were one. I'm two. starting, I'm starting at 10. Okay. I'm going up to gotcha. one. Okay. So number like, number nine is Daryl K. Royal, Texas Memorial Stadium. So that's where the Longhorns play. That's 10,119. So it's just barely over uh, Alabama. Uh, number eight is Tiger Stadium, LSU. That's 102,321. Number seven is Neyland Stadium, which is where the volunteers play in Tennessee. And That's throw 100... golf balls. Yes, oh, oh we didn't talk about this. Balls. Did you oh, see yeah, Lane Kiffin after the game? He was walking out of the stadium. Someone threw a spitter at him as he was walking out no, of the it's stadium. A spittoon. <laughs> spitter, spittoon, either way. And he, Odell's that bitch, just one hands it leans back and grabs him, puts it around the ground. It was incredible. He is flanked by two state troopers and they both ducked and he just Odell's that bitch. Yeah. Not, not oh, where did Odell go to school? Wait, what? Where did Odell go to school? Uh, L- LSU, right? No. Where's Link yeah. Kiffin going? Oh, uh, <laughs> there it is. You heard it here uh, first guys. Um, so Neyland stadium has 102,455. Uh, people. Uh, so number six is Kyle Field. So that's A and M, and that is one hundred and two thousand seven hundred and thirty-three. <sighs> so a lot of these are grouped pretty close. Um, Ohio so Stadium is number five. Uh, the the Horseshoe. That's one hundred and two thousand seven hundred eighty. Uh, and then you have a jump here. So then number four, uh, and I feel like M- Michigan and Beaver Stadium at Penn State, Happy Valley, are always pretty close to each other and almost like competing. They're always like adding spot. like a few more handicap accessible seats or exactly. something. Exactly. Like I think that. the handicap ones take away though. I think that's oh, opposite. that's what it is. Yeah. yeah, I think the handicap seats take away more space than you you lose some of the capacity. Yeah. yeah. Um. So Beaver Stadium, uh, was at one hundred six thousand. 572. Uh, like I said, Michigan Stadium was 107,601. Uh, and then the top two is Sardar Patel Stadium. That's in India. So they have 110,000. Uh, and it's a uh, uh, well known cricket stadium. So it's the largest hmm. uh, cricket stadium. Uh, yeah. Uh, so it's very big. Uh, I believe that's where their national um, team plays as well uh, cricket. And then the number one here, surpriser is Rungrado May Day Stadium, uh, which is in North Korea. Oh. So it's being used a lot. Allegedly. And they claim it holds 150,000. <laughs> yeah. But outside of their state-run media, 
uh, other people have confirmed it to be closer to 114,000. Looking at pictures, <laughs> it doesn't. I mean, there's a giant track around the field, so like yeah. maybe it is bigger than it looks because the, the seats don't get that close to the field, but it doesn't look bigger than the big house. Yeah, it was definitely something where like when North Korea was like, we need to one up the world on something. So let's build this thing and make sure <laughs> we, we we call it a million people can be in it. Yeah, that's where they uh, everyone goes to watch people uh, run into a piece of concrete base first. <laughs> uh, yeah. OK, uh, so what do you guys uh, predictions for this game? What do you guys think? What's going to happen? <laughs> Northwestern Michigan Dog walk noon game on Fox in Ann Arbor. Wolverine's Mike. dog walk him. Joe? Yeah, I think Michigan wins fairly easily, but at the same time, I have I have seen them, like Nebraska, um, if they don't keep the pedal down, then could yeah, keep but Northwestern it's a home. in it. I don't think they're, yeah, yeah, that's they're going to be looking point. ahead. Oh, no, I, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah they're, they're, good. they're fine. Yeah, hopefully. I would say this is a typical trap game, but not with Northwestern. Like the spot is a trap game ahead of Michigan, Michigan State, but because it's Northwestern and it's at Michigan Stadium, I think it's going to be. Yes. What's the line at? It's probably large. I'm going to say it's probably going to be 20 or so. I, I think they're just going to absolutely. That would be interesting because well, I guess Michigan and has 23 and a half. Big yeah, that's what I would expect. And that's what I think is going to happen here. Northwestern's just not talented enough uh, to hey, make this good, really a game. Good teams win, great teams cover. Northwestern <laughs> might be a great team this weekend. We'll see. Yeah, I, I just don't think they have enough to score to, to keep I, I don't their offense just really isn't isn't much here. Um but all right guys, so that's gonna do it for us this week. So follow us on Instagram at whiskers.whiskies and please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, don't forget to check out our Saturday morning betting posts as well. And please send us your favorite bets for the weekend. Sharing is always caring, folks. Sharing please. is caring. Please. We need please, your help. Please always so join us next week for a huge episode when we talk about the Hartman trophy so for mike and joe i'm ej always remember too much of anything is bad but too much good whiskey is barely enough cheers boys cheers